Let's sing this together, my friends. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship Him. Welcome back. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to.
thank you for jumping through the hoops, sitting appropriately. Charlie, I've already apologized for blocking off his seat. I actually set the entire system of how we're separated based on where Charlie sits. I'm like, <laughs> I, put a, I put a block on that and then we went from there. Um, thank you, thank you so much for gathering with the body of Christ today. It has been a long time, and, and even with um, me being out here on a somewhat regular basis and getting to see a lot of you, um, it is wonderful to see your faces and be together. Zoom is a wonderful technology. I'm grateful for it. I am tired of it. Um, and, and we will continue using it here, there, and everywhere, so it's a good thing. But I love to be together and gather with the body of Christ together. Um, so on that, a couple business items. Are you ready? Um, first and foremost, all of the protocols we are trying to follow today with the seating and wearing mat, all of those things we're doing because we love you and we love each other and we're trying to care for one another as we honor the governor and honor the rules and thank you for complying with those to the best of your ability. I'm not sure, I haven't seen in the back, there's some young families in the back, um, I think, I haven't seen them and they could be, there could be fires started back there for all I know right now. Um, but here, right here, thank you so much for being here together and gathering. Um, and as we move forward, this week, we are doing a communion service. We're gathering to do communion, and this is going to be new and different, and I'll explain a little bit more later how we're going to do it. Um, it's not our regular way of doing it, um, and we will get back to that as soon as, as, soon as it works out and it, it's fitting, but I'll kind of walk through that today. So it'll be a shorter service today, but we're just here to gather to worship our God and celebrate what he has done for us. That is what we're doing today. A um, couple items for you guys, preaching schedule. Next week, Brad Bruiser from Genesis Church will be here filling the pulpit for us and um, looking forward to that time. Then the following week, which is the 7th, whatever Sunday is the first Sunday in June, that day, um, Pastor Dave Knowles will be here and we have called him to be our interim pastor. Um, so he will be joining us so we've, we've set it up so he will be with us for three months guaranteed and looking at three-month increments as we look forward to the next guy as we search in earnest for the next preaching pastor of his place church. So continue. Thank you for your prayers, your comments. Um, continue praying to see where God is going to take us at his place church. So there's the announcement part. Some other businessy stuff. stuff. Um, there is, we're not passing the offering bags today because that's the best way to get COVID, um, according to, I'm joking, sorry, I, I told myself no smart aleck comments. It's, <laughs> so in the back, if you guys can look, some of you guys can't see, but in the back, next to this door over here, there is a metal box with a slot in the top, so as you come and go, and that will be up there henceforth and forevermore, and we, as we kind of move through the, the summer, we'll see if we're gonna, how we're going to continue on with that doing offerings, but right now you can put your offerings in that basket back there, and it'll be collected. Um, it, ah, I can be trained, they say. Um, so... Thank you, and thank you for all those who have jumped through the hoops trying to get online, do online banking and all that stuff. It has been a crazy time here in the Inland Northwest and in America and in our world as you guys have been so gracious to work through that as we figure things out as we move forward. So, I think, was what else did I have to talk about? Do you remember? Because I wrote it down. Memorial, well, I knew that part, but I was like, there was another announcement, I thought. Growth groups. Growth groups. How many of you guys are meeting in growth groups by Zoom or by other means? In person. Wonderful. Actual people gathering together is a good thing. Um, so as you do that, I encourage you guys to gather together. As things are opening up, go hiking, go running, go jogging, or go to a coffee place, because I think those are open again. Um, Jason German has saved over $12,000 of his personal budget because of the coffee <laughs> being closed down. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So, 
So gathered together, it is, it's good, and the weather is beautiful. Um, the one thing, and this is me being a stickler, when you guys are leaving today, don't hang around and hug. Go hug outside so I don't have to feel guilty about it. Um, go to lunch somewhere and overwhelm them and tip big like Christians should. Um, that's, I think that's it for the announcement part. Memorial Day. I didn't know till Wednesday at 3 o'clock that Memorial Day was Monday, tomorrow. <laughs> because my whole schedule has been kind of out of round. And so Melinda put on the front door of the office, offices will be closed on Monday. And I'm like, why would she do that for Memorial Day? Oh, we're doing that again this year. So it is, so it's a long weekend. So now you can definitely go hiking and camping with people um, from church. But Memorial Day, what is Memorial Day? We're remembering the sacrifice of the men and women in the armed forces who have sacrificed and died for the freedoms that we have in this country. And sometimes, and this is just as a confession, I have gone up and down on a roller coaster between a grumbling heart and a grateful heart in the last couple months. And this is a good reminder for us to thank God, to genuinely thank God and remember those that have sacrificed their lives that we can be here We can preach the gospel, we can gather, we can sing, even if it is in our homes, we have a lot of freedoms here to be grateful for. So remember those that have served our country. Um, Let's pray. I'm going to pray, then we're going to sing, and then we are going to kind of move into a time of communion and worship. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Holy God, we worship you because you are worthy of worship. Father, you have given us everything we need to worship you, to know you to honor you, to love you. Thank you that we can gather, even though there are many around this country, around this world that can't gather for various reasons and some um, because of suffering. Father, we, we pray for those churches right now. Thank you for the freedoms that we have. Thank you for those that sacrificed and died on our behalf to lay down their lives for freedom, Father. And as we love our country, Father, we love your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And Father, help us to remember that in the midst of all that we go through. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that we can gather here today, worship together. Thank you for the smiling faces of brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to lift one another up, encourage each other, and spur each other on to love and good works. Thank you, Father, in your son's name. Amen. Call 
12, 23, and 24, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. It's rewriting my history. Ooh, it covers me with destiny. I love that song. Now, I just heard that song on Tuesday for the first time. Um, we, we've been talking through 1 Peter, and 1 Peter starts off with one of my favorite passages of the gospel message, and it talks about our identity in Christ. Paul does it too in Ephesians. He starts off Ephesians with our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ because of his blood um, this morning, we're going to do communion, and, I, and like I said, we'll, um, we'll be doing it a little bit different. Now, I don't know about you, I grew up in a church where, like all good Christians in the England Northwest, the first Monday of every month, on, or first Sunday of every month, you passed golden plates with little cups of juice and little wafers in it. And so I, the first church I went to, the second church I went to, 
and Christ or Hope, the last church I came from before I came out here, we all had the, I think it was the matching set everywhere you went. And so, and I'm, I'm not making fun. That is, that is kind of the Christian culture that I came from. That is what we did. And so then when I first came out here, Melissa and I came out because Dawn and Cindy were out here. We came out to visit on occasion and we came out to do communion. I'm like, what are these wacky people doing? And it was a beautiful thing. It was wonderful to take communion in the way that we had, we've been doing it. Um, and so it, for me, and that was like probably seven, eight years ago, it kind of like opened my eyes like, oh, I guess not every church in the entire planet does exactly like Valley Forth did when I was seven. Um, but so, so with that, it is a wonderful thing that we can do communion together, no matter how we do it. I've heard some wonderful reports with some groups gathering six feet apart around a campfire doing communion together, some growth groups doing communion together, and just coming together and remembering the Lord's Supper together. And that's what we want to do today. So today... It's going to be a little bit different. I'll walk you through the how-tos, but just so you know, because we're not passing things around and we're not going to gather and we're not all going to touch the same basket of bread. So what we are going to do is on the pews in front of you, and you don't have to grab them now, and if there's not enough, there's baskets down here. We have little, and I, excuse me for being a smart aleck, but they look like Lunchables. They're just the cutest little cups, and they've got the bread and the wine in there, the juice in there. So we'll be partaking that way together. Um, it'll be wonderful. I am excited. I've been looking forward to this. And like I was hoping that we could do it for Easter. And then I was hoping we could do it when we, well, now we're doing it. So I'm excited. Um, and not that you have to come here to this building to do it. So I, I encourage you guys every time you gather to remember the Lord and what he's done for us. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be doing today. Um, I'm going to do a short sermonette. How's that sound? So that way we can still beat the Baptist to KFC today. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my nervous, when I get nervous, I go to humor. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not. Um, but what I'd like to do today um, for the passage to look at, I would like to look at the book of John. And because we are remembering today what Jesus did on the cross, um, his body broken and his blood spilled, I would like to read, and it's a big section, but I think it's a good section. I tried to kind of chop it up, and it's like, no, we can't. It's got to be read all in one fell swoop. So we'll be reading John 19 and 20. John 19 and 20. Um, it's a long passage, so I won't have you stand for the reading of God's word, but if you'd read along with me, that would be wonderful. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the, other, and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him, because there was no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered into his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all, unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, in Aramaic, Gabbatha. 
Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and they went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side. And Jesus, between them, Pilate also wrote in an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, I have written what I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. For it was to fulfill the scripture, which said, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he, whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he s- finished, said to the fulfillment of Scripture, I thirst. A jar, of, a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldier came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he took away the body, took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Just a quick comment before we continue on to two. You see some very specific fulfillment of prophecy in here, and you even hear John say um, that his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, and that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Just keep that in your mind for a moment. Chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom, he, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. 
So Peter went with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw that the linen cloths li- saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head had not been lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place of itself by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to the story of Thomas. Jesus appeared to Mary. He appeared to the disciples. Thomas was not there. And we jump down to to 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and the place and place my fingers into the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands? Put, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not believe, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. Let me pray really quick. Father, as we read your word, your revelation to us, as we read this story, Father, it's not just a story. This is a life changing. It is the, it is the means by which we are saved. That you sent your son to die on the cross on our behalf. Father, we worship you and we thank you for that. Thank you that you have given us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We thank you. Amen. So, comments. That passage, how many times have you guys read that passage? Whether in Luke, Matthew, or John, you've read that passage, read this, this story. During Easter, we read... Um, the road to Emmaus, some of the disciples and them hearing. And there's, there's this word that kind of comes through here in John several times, um, the word believe. Then they believed, or I won't believe. There was disbelief. And so I want to just talk about that just a little bit. Um, I love, this is just some, some random comments, so bear with me, but I love this passage. And, and, and I skipped those two passages, not because they're not important, they're very important. But I wanted to get to Thomas and the one, one little point there where he says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. When I was a kid and very immature, so that means right up until today, um, I always thought, and, and we probably all thought this, and if you haven't, don't tell me about it. We have... So many times when I was a kid, I was like, man, if I could only have been there with the disciples, one, I could have told them, hey, pay attention. I get it. And I'm like 12 years old. And these are grown men. And then the other side of it is like, if I could have just been there and seen the miracles. Because when you struggle with faith, as a young child, as a teenager, as a college student, as a young adult, as a 44-year-old man, when you're struggling with faith and believing the truths of the gospel, we're still tempted to say, boy, if I could just see, maybe just see one miracle. If there could be some sign that I could see, then I would, then I would, it'd be rock solid. I wouldn't have these doubts anymore. But Jesus gives us a very, very key point right here. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. We've been given the gift of salvation. Those who hear God's word and respond to it by faith. 
And what a great opportunity. And, and as we struggle with our faith from time to time, the body of Christ, that's where we speak truth into each other's lives, as we encourage each other with these truths. And even as we take communion today, that's what we're doing. We are remembering. Because are we a forgetful people? Personally, I forget daily the truths of the gospel. Again, looking at the Old Testament, looking at the um, Israelites wandering through the desert, and you go, man, those knuckleheads, what were they thinking? It's like, and the older I get, the more I say, I am, would have been one of those knuckleheads. I am a knucklehead. But there, I would have been right there with them in many of my doubts. So we thank God for the faith that he gives us and the call to believe. Now, there's 38,000, give or take, other points from this passage that I will not talk about. So read it again, read it again, read it again. Um, and, you, and many of you guys know me. Um, David, okay, what, what's your point? You, we're talking about communion. What's your point? And, and some of you guys know me. And when it comes to getting to the point, I am someone who loves rabbit trails. I'm one of those guys, I love tangents. I love rants. Um, I like going off the beaten path. In fact, one of the, this one time, I was going off the beaten path, and this guy who I was with, working with was telling, well, in fact, his dad was my dad's cousin. Well, no, okay, wait, all right, wait, see. Okay, sorry, I apologize. What is the point? And, and here's the point from all of this that I would like to look at specifically, um, and it is John 20, 31. And I love this passage I memorized it back in Awana days, millions of years ago, and it was one of those verses you had to, to memorize, and then it has rung true for me again and again and again throughout my life. And, and sometimes, uh, this is not sometimes, this verse, when I think about the whole counsel of God, you think about biblical theology, Genesis, the creator God, all the way to Revelation, the end of all time, this verse is for that, the whole book, and it, is, it says... But these are written, and he's specifically talking about his book, the uh, apostle that Jesus loved. Notice how he puts that in there. And he's also the faster apostle than Peter. I don't know if those are. But he wrote these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the promised one, the Son of God. And by believing, you'll have life in his name. That is huge. This is huge thing. And so this is what we're celebrating. Even as we're doing communion today, this is what we're remembering. Again, as a child, we did communion, and it was the thing that you did on that, and became this routine. And not because it was a bad thing to do it on the first Sunday of the month, but for me, in my immaturity and impatience, we used to play a game. where We dropped the pencil, my brother, and see if you could hit the bullseye on the, on the uh, bulletin on the ground and just hope your mom didn't see you. I didn't sit through church to worship God. I sat through church because I had to. And communion was very, very similar to that to me. And as I've gotten older and you remember these truths, this is why we rejoice. This is why we can endure suffering is because Jesus died on the cross on our behalf so that we can know the God of the universe, be saved, set apart for good works. And it's a good thing. There, I'm doing it again. I'm gonna go back to my notes. The, the one point I was, again, as a child, I thought, believe. And, you, and you've heard the gospel. We have the gospel this, the gospel that. And it's almost became a catchphrase in our culture, again, in the Christian culture. So defining what the gospel is, is very, very important. And so when we say we believe, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you have life in his name. For me, that was growing up, and even as a young man, that was a a witnessing verse. So you'd give them a list of verses and truths from the Bible, which is good, it's accurate, should be done. But then I'd finish with that. So these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. And if that person came to Christ, it was like, well, now that verse has served its purpose. We'll save it for the next unbeliever. And that's even how I thought about the gospel. When I thought about the gospel, that we made bracelets in VBS, you made coloring books, you had all these walk through the you know, Romans road and all of these four spiritual laws. There's all these wonderful tracks and plans for how to share the gospel with unbelievers. And in my mind, the gospel was, and excuse the, the picture, but was a, not a sales pitch as it was 
a fault. This, this is how you hook people in, and then you become a Christian. As I've gotten older, I've realized the gospel is where we live. It's not just the in. As we have come to Christ in belief, it is where we live as believers. We're going through 1 Peter, and it is wonderful. Again, I love that first part of 1 Peter. It's another one of those verses that I have to read to myself all the time to remember who I am in Christ. Because I forget. My belief falters, and I forget who I am. So I step into sin, and it's not because I'm a horrible, wretched sinner. No, I am a saved saint who's forgotten who he is. Somebody, I can't remember who was saying it yesterday, I think it was Dan Woodard, was talking about putting on your flesh boots and your flesh gloves. It's like, that's not who you are. You're trying to live this old life. Anyhow, the gospel, to believe. This is what the Apostle John is talking and he's asking us to do. This is why he wrote this book and this is what we're calling people to do. So we're calling people that have never heard. One, whether it's your neighbor who's just, I went to church as a kid, but they've never heard the good news that the creator God is making a way for us to know him. That is good news. So you share that with them. It could be um, on on the mission field, people that have never heard the good news of God's word. In America, you've always got glimpses of, but maybe they've never heard the gospel. There are places on this planet they have never heard anything for generations. So whether the gospel is being shared in that context, whether you're sharing it with your children, fathers, teach your children the truths of God's word. Mothers, teach your children the truths of God's word. Share the gospel, the saving truths with them and call them to believe. We continue to share this good news. We call people to believe that have rejected the gospel, have walked away from it. Every opportunity we can to speak truth, lovingly, gently, in a winsome way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that, who hate the gospel. Share with those who are young. Call them to believe. Um, like I said, from children, from, from youth, and I mean youth, call them to the truths of the gospel. Tell them the story of the Bible of what God has done. Old, doesn't matter if you're 438, which I think is impossible, but we can talk details later. Share. We talk about um, the tragedy, even in this COVID thing. There's been a lot of people that have died because of this. And we can talk percentages and numbers and all those things, but every soul that has passed away because of this is a tragedy. With malaria, with influenza, with cancer, heart disease, all of those things, it's a tragedy when a human life is lost because God is the giver of life. So every opportunity, even if it's a 90-year-old man or woman laying on their deathbed, to share the gospel and call them to believe. Every opportunity that we have. We teach these truths with our brothers and sisters. So someone who's a believer, I, I have asked and asked you to speak these truths into my life. To have brothers and sisters who can say, hey David, this is not what the Bible says how you're supposed to act. You're acting, outside. You're acting like a non-believer. You're a believer. You're a called one, a saint. Live like how you're, spo- how you're supposed to live. This gospel, good news, is the core of the Christian life. And again, back to 1 Peter. All of those commands, submitting to authority, ooh, I was not 100% comfortable with that. But guess what? That command is easy to obey if we're followers of Christ. That's who we are in the light of the gospel. This isn't our kingdom. We have an everlasting kingdom that we have been called into as children of God. What a wonderful, wonderful gift. So Peter does it. The apostle Paul does it. Like I said, in Ephesians, he does it. Again, a great passage. This is who you are. And in the light of who you are, chapter four, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. So all of these commands and all these calls to obedience that we see are all based on the gospel truth of who you are in Christ. Those that believe. These two chapters we focused on primarily, and then that verse specifically. um, I always love to say this, maybe it's the Sunday school 
side of me. I love teaching Sunday school, and I love kids when they realize that this, and this, again, just a little personal history, it was, I always separated my churchy history and Bible stories, which I believed were true, and then as you learn about Greek history, and you learn about ancient Mesopotamia, and you learn about Ur, you know, you learn about all these things in history and time, and the overlap, it was almost like two different worlds for me. And there was a couple realizations, big realizations, the most recent one, it's almost embarrassing to say, because it was probably, there was some curriculum the kids were doing where they're singing the song, History from Ancient Greece, to the end of the Roman Empire, including the life of Christ. And all of a sudden I went, started putting those matches together. Now, and okay, forgive me for this one. How many of you guys have seen the movie 300? Don't raise your hand. There's a movie called 300. It's about the Spartans that, that keep the, who was it? It was, well, it was Artaxerxes. Well, someone brought it up and they said that, that Artaxerxes was either the, the Artaxerxes in Esther or his son. That blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute. Those things happened in the same world? Yes, they did. This is real history, real time, real place, real people. And that is what the Apostle John is saying. That's why he lists out those fulfillment of scriptures. This happened. John was a witness. Jesus' mother was a witness. Peter was a witness. Paul was a witness. These things happened and he is sharing these so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, the one promised all the way from Genesis 3. He promised to Abraham. We see it in both, you see it in David. All of these promises fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'll stop for just a little bit. Take a breath, David. Um, I would like to... It, it, the reason I wanted to focus on this is because every single time that we gather together as believers, as we're marching through the scripture and we're, we're hearing good preaching every week, as we sing songs of worship, as we fellowship with one another, as we give faithfully in our service and our money, as we gather as saints, this is the foundation of why we're here. I love to be together with you guys. It is a wonderful gift to me to see faces on the other side of us without a screen being between us. It is wonderful. But just because you're all wonderful people isn't the reason I'm here. Some of you, I like more than others. But I, <laughs> that's not why I'm here. I'm here to celebrate Christ, what he has done for me, and be in this body that I don't fully understand as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as we're conformed in the image of Christ, as we spur each other on to love and good deeds. That is why we're here. And that is why we are going to be taking communion today. One, it's a command. Two, it is a joy to take communion together. So, okay, I'm done ranting for a little bit. But 1 Corinthians, um, the passage, and the reason I chose 1 Corinthians as the passage, partially is because the apostles were there. They heard Jesus speak these words in the upper room. Paul, as an example, is saying it as an instruction. Now, he's saying it in 1 Corinthians there. He's saying it, saying um, this a letter of correction. Some of the things in the first 10 chapters of 1 Corinthians are not necessarily encouragements and uplifting and praising of the church in Corinth. There's some pretty biting things. And even in this passage, um, this communion passage in 1 Corinthians 11, and you can turn there with me, please. It starts off with, he's chiding them. He's correcting them. Starts off in verse 17, but in the following instructions, so he's giving them instructions of communion. And, and so again, this is something that the Apostle Paul and the churches are participating in, and we are going to participate in right along with them. But he starts off with a correction. I do not commend you because you have come together for the better of the world. He is not commending them because they're fighting. They're drinking too much. They're eating and not sharing. People are hungry. People are full. There's, this, there's this, these factions, these discrepancies in the, in the body. So he's chiding them. But for us today, we're looking at verse 23 through 26. I'm going to read that, and then I'll give you some instructions on the cups. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, verse 19, chapter 19 of John, we see the crucifixion and we remember the death, the sacrifice, the breaking of the body, the spilling of the blood on our behalf. Chapter 20, we see the resurrection of Christ from the dead, which means that we have a resurrection. It's, it's, death isn't the end of it. If you're a believer, a follower of Christ, you'll be raised from the dead and be with him forever. So until he comes, we are going to remember the, the body. We are going to remember the blood spilled for us. So with that, a little pragmatism. Now we've got to pick up cups. So if you guys would grab those cups, and let me just walk you through. I've got to get one so I can demonstrate. I didn't think about this part. I'm holding a mic. Okay. <laughs> I watched a video of how this went badly. So, <laughs> so you grab it with your teeth. Thank you, Dan. Now, the, this is, so I watched a little video. It was one of the sales pitch for these little cups. And they said, you have to be careful because one, there's an order. And even in the order in the scripture, it's laid out that we do the bread, then the wine. If you open the wine first, the bread's going to be pretty difficult to get out because of physics. Um, and it's also, as you peel it open, these go pretty easy. But if you peel it fast, there might be a baptism in the process. And it's not a full immersion, which... so. We got to be careful. So be careful as you peel. Peel gently and slowly. So go ahead, go ahead and open up your uh, your communion cup for the bread, and we'll read it. Thank you, Dan. You get a raise. So we'll walk through this, and then I will pray, and then the worship team will lead us in some singing. But first, before we kind of walk through this process. If you just want to take just one or two minutes, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Again, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm not going to make you fold your hands, but just get quiet. And I want you to think about and remember these things in your own heart before we participate together and thank God for what he has done. Father, we, we thank you that you, in your great wisdom, in your perfect holiness, Father, that you, part of your plan, sent your son to be broken, to be beaten, bloodied, and broken on the cross. Father, we thank you for sending your son. Go ahead and take your, your bread. At the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and broke it, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. As often as you take it, remember me. Let's partake together. Let's take another moment, and we think about the sacrifice of Jesus, but the blood being spilled, that payment. We just sang a song talking about that payment, that blood covers our sin. The sacrificial lamb all the way from the law 
of Moses, there was so much blood on the altar because of the sin of the people. But Jesus was the perfect, perfect lamb, sinless, and died on our behalf. Let's just take a moment and pray and thank God for that. Father, it's because of you sending your son, Jesus' death on the cross, the shedding of his blood, that we can be washed clean, that we can stand before you on the day of judgment without fear of our salvation because that blood paid the price, redeemed us, set us apart. We're now seen as righteous in your sight because of Jesus and what he has done for us. Father, we thank you for sending your son. Thank you. Amen. Then on that same night, Jesus took the wine and blessed it. And he said, take, drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, remember me. Let's drink together. Let's pray. Thank God for what he has done as we celebrate and remember the life, the death, burial, resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Holy Father, you are the creator, God. You have created everything. You've created us. And Father, you've laid out a plan. Adam and Eve sinned as the first man sinned, the first Adam sinned, and brought about death. Father, we were lost. But you had a plan right from the beginning to send a Messiah, to send a Savior to make a way for sinful man to be right with you and to call a people to yourself, to redeem, to buy, to purchase a people to yourself. Once we were not a people, but now we are a people. Father, we thank you for the gift. Help us to remember this. Even as we celebrate communion, we take these elements in remembrance of you. Father, help us to remember when we get in our cars what you have done for us, done for us, that we live as believers, people set apart, called for your purposes, to live lives of obedience, and not out of compulsion, but of joy, that we are part of the kingdom of God, and out of love, that we love you so much that we are willing to submit to the authority you've put over us, that we're willing to love each other even when we're not lovely to each other, Help us be a people that is forgiving, loving, caring, and gracious and act to each other as you have acted toward us. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for this body here at his place that's gathered here in the building, either here in the auditorium, back in the back, in other rooms. And Father, for those that are worshiping at home, thank you for the body of Christ here at his place. Thank you for the body of Christ here in the Inland Northwest, even my own brothers and sisters at other churches who I know and love and trust, and for those around the world, Father, that are, that are in much, much worse situations than we are. Father, that are rejoicing over these same truths that we are called to be a part of your family, Father. Thank you for that. Bless these people as they go out today with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, in your son's name, amen. i
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness 
through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me. and love in our hearts for what you did for us, Lord. Words just don't cut it. We thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that it was pleasing to you, that our hearts, that as we leave this building, that our hearts will be right before you. We thank you for the justification that you gave us, the sanctification that you walk us through, and that living hope that we have in you for an eternity at your feet. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 So, what's the main point? Believe. And what we believe is what we just sang, what Dia just prayed. This is who we are. This is who we are in Christ. 
So today, don't touch each other. <laughs> till you're out, till you're out of my sight, then I don't care. No. Love the brothers and sisters. Go out there and le live the lives that God has called you to live as we celebrate who we are in Christ. Thank you for being here, and we will see you next week. Oh, and your sippy cups. Thank you, John, for bringing that. You can leave them right there. Deal, we'll pick them all up right after that. I know. We'll take care of them. I'll take care of them. Thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs>